It's time. Okay. <laughs> so first, thanks for uh, to the organizer of the meeting to inviting me. Uh, it's been a long time I haven't been to Weeds, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, um, and yeah, the best part of doing a, a talk is that you can pick the title, and no one can understand what's behind it. But um, so I'll, uh, Chloe thought I was going to talk about size. I used to talk about size a lot, about size, if it matters or not. If I sit next to, <laughs> to Adrian, you'll see it, it does. <laughs> But uh, today I'll talk more about other stuff of particles and mostly their shape. Uh, so that's why I picked that title. And, and please don't judge me. Not because of that book and that movie, okay? You're judging, I know you are. <laughs> but I'll get to the, to the topic. Uh, a bit faster now. So um, we uh, all know what the gravitational pump here uh, is. I'm not going to get into that. I love that paper from, from Phil and, and, and et al. But uh, the thing is, uh, when you look at the gravitational pump in schematic, most of the time, they try to like super simplify it. Okay. Uh, when you look at the particles, the particles are usually presented like this. Uh, I once was at, uh, at Scripps, and uh, there was Farouk there, and he, he told me after a talk I gave, it's like, you should, should sit down in the lab again and look at microscope. Because when you look at microscope, what you see, it's actually this. It's a big mess. It's like aggregates, and the community that is making and using them is very complex. And so this is something that I like to remind to people. It's like when you think of the gravitational pump or the biological pump in general, we try to oversimplify it. It's nice because for modelers like Dave, it's very simple to put that in model, but then, then you forget that it's a biological process. And what is fun in biology is that it's a complex thing. And, and, and when you get into that, if you look at what is done in, for example, the microbiota or, uh, or the gut microbiome in general, it's, uh, they, they tend to use the complexity of the system to understand processes, and this is what we should do in, uh, in our field as well. So just to put that in that scheme, if you take an aggregate here, uh, what an aggregate is about. Uh, so I, I was in, in uh, an ASLO meeting in 2012, and I remember seeing a keynote from uh, Roman Stoker, and he had that video, so I, I sent him an email, and he, he just sent me the video back. And uh, if you look at an aggregate, so the, the aggregate is in the dark background here. And what you have here in colors, in uh, reddish, it's all the bacteria that slowly colonize the aggregate over time. So it's not in real time, it's accelerated. But what you see slowly, it's that the, aggreg the aggregate will start to appear in the middle of the image. You have some on the side as well. And it's how fast actually the biology uh, consume or get to something that is in water and to use it. So these are all bacteria. It's a temperature dish, okay, it's not the ocean, but it gives you an idea of how fast things are going and how uh, the biology change whatever is thinking. Whether it's bacteria, I have videos also, I didn't put it in the side of plankton, but it's also plankton feeding on it, uh, but it's the same thing. It goes very fast and it changes everything in the water. So today I decided to talk about two things, how to study the gravitational carbon pump using two types of approaches, like what you have here on the left is genomics approach, and what you have here on the right, what I used to do for like the last 20 years, it's imaging. So the cool thing of this is that you can really get into the complexity of the system. So the genomics, for those of you that know what it is, it's going to be like a fairly simple graph. For the others, it's what you have on the left is single cell genomic. What you can get with this is what, whatever is attached to a uh, an aggregate, for example, you take a bacteria and you calculate the full genome of that bacteria, or you can do the same thing for a protist, for example. And when you do that, you get to the full genome of the species, and so you can access to whatever uh, functional, uh, I mean, function they have to use the aggregate or use the material in the water. What you have on the, on the two other things is like more meta-omics, 
which give you uh, species, kind of with meta B, so it's barcode, it's similar to species, or metagenomics data that give you all the genes available in the system and the transcriptonic, what the organisms are actually doing at one point in the time. And, and here it's images, and so with images, you have another level of complexity that gets you to the shape, and that's, uh, I'll get that to in a bit later. But the cool thing with these new tools is that you can get to particle composition, but the composition in terms of biology, you can get like the hominization rates based on their genes or thinking rate, for example, if you use imaging. So to dive into the, the, the omics a bit, um, so this is uh, uh, an earlier work that I did in, uh, with friends, with colleagues in 2016. And what we did is we combined all the genomics data that we had during Tara Ocean and, and imaging data to combine, to try to explain the variability of fluxes as seen by images. And, uh, and how it can be explained by the complex data of the metagenomics. I'm not gonna get into the detail of how we've done that because it's a big mess, but what you had is that nice, neat plot here that describes the full community that potentially lead to fluxes, uh, whether it's particle formation or particle exports. You have all the bacteria potentially involved, the eukaryote and the viruses. And the cool thing of that study is that it was the first time that we really pointed the, the potential role of viruses. But that was a study that was not based on particles themselves. It was like looking at uh, metagenomic data and fluxes, independent data set, but not particular in what was on it. So you could doubt that, uh, you could have doubt about this network here that could actually be in link to, to fluxes or to, to export. But since then, uh, people in Hawaii, uh, the, the group from uh, Ed, Carl, and, and uh, Ed DeLong, Dave Carl, and the others, they were was in sediment trap. And uh, so that's what you have here. That's one of the first data sets in uh, metabar coding. And uh, they had, uh, so they looked at uh, over almost a year, the community composition of, uh, of aggregates, what was on it. And what you could find, it's a bunch of species like Metazoan here, uh, uh, Rizarian here, for example, that showed up. That was also part of the network that we found in 2016. So there seems to be something coherent in the data set that you have, whatever you find as a correlation in the water column and whatever you can find at 4,000 meter in the water column on aggregates directly. A year later, they used the full time series that they had on genomics, and, and so this, the, the information started to be a bit more complex because when you, you look at so the three different years, you had like here the, the pattern of export fluxes, uh, it's carbon flux, I don't remember what that's here, but uh, what you have here, it's the genomic data of other years, and you clearly see that the community is different depending on the year. So they went into these differences and tried to explain it, and what they found is that you actually had different type of community that were uh, uh, that could explain the variability of the flux at different time of the season. For example, uh, the, what they called the summer export pulse was mostly due to a community composition uh, led by diatom and diazotroph. Uh, and and then they could link the composition to potential traits uh, in the system. So this. This is interesting because you can tease apart who's doing what and why they're doing it or how they were doing it. And so uh, for modelers, this makes sense. It's, it's important because then you can uh, use different traits in your model to try to explain variability of different flux at different seasons. So that was for summer, they checked what was responsible of the, of the, the peak of fluxes in spring when it happened because it not always happened in Aloha. And they did it for the rest of the year as well. And every time you have different part of the community that lead to different type of particular depths. And so different function as well. So I, to I told you that viruses were quite important in the network that we produced in 2016, but it were, I wasn't sure what kind of role they could play. And uh, so they also digged into what, what they found as viruses community attached to particle at Aloha. And so the interesting thing is that they found similar 
viruses, especially the cyanophage, that were uh, that we identified as potential contributor to export fluxes, and they could link that to a potential uh, main role of viruses in the viral shuttle, because you had two hypotheses uh, in the term of viral role in the, the carbon pump, whether it's a shuttle or a shunt of the pump, and their study shows that it's probably more a shuttle than a pump, uh, than a then you've seen that a bit earlier, the work from uh, Colin, and uh, what she did is she looked at, uh, so that was all about metagenomic data, but it was from the bulk of the particle in the trap. But uh, what Colin did is that she looked at individual particles here, thinking particles in, in the traps. And, and what she could do is to link particle types to potential composition uh, using this genomic data based on single particle uh, sequencing. So this is also a pretty cool uh, avenue for what we're doing because then you have a direct link between community composition and particle types, which is what we care about. And, and another example of cool work that is done is that not only looking at the, the genomic data, you look at the proteomic data and so find specific pathways of specific organisms that are involved in different processes, example, for like the romanization of particles, and you can identify in their genomes what is actually uh, the, the pathway that they use to degrade particles. Okay, so I talked a lot about genomic data. I'll get into the imaging in a, in a bit, but just to uh, to see how complex that can be, it's that um, we talk about thinking rates a lot in that session. And um, when you usually you think, think about thinking rate, when you think about a particle that is thinking fast, you think it's going to escape homogenization because it can get to depth quickly. But what Roman and his colleague uh, did in that paper, they looked at, the, so they put an aggregate, uh, the, the same aggregate you've seen in the image, in the movie before, in the flow chamber, and they looked at their, uh, the way the particle is uh, 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 remineralized over time, so they, the, the change of volume of that particle over time, and they increased the flow speed in that chamber. What they found actually is quite the opposite. There was a, the, the, so the, when you increase the flow speed, meaning that you increase the sinking rate artificially of particles, what you have is actually an increase of the remineralization and not a decrease, which is counterintuitive, but if you look at the, the composition of the particle at the, the molecular level, then what they found is that there was a, a linear relationship between the, the degradation, the, the maximum of the degradation rate and the oligoalginate concentration of these particles. And what it, what, what it was, it was actually when you increase the, the flow speed in the chamber or the sinking, re uh, sinking rate of the aggregate, you wash away a lot of oligo uh, alginates that compete with the alginate liase that can actually degrade the particles. So it's counterintuitive because of that complexity. I mean, this kind of complexity will never be resolved in model, but uh, actually gives you an idea of how far we need to get if we want to understand processes that lead to different degradation rates in the water column. And so clearly, all that shows you that there's, in, there's a clear need to better understand the sinking speed of particles and what is actually making the particles. That was part of the discussion that we had before. So in terms of sinking rates, this is a big compilation of data from uh, Emmanuel. It's not randomly generated by ChatGPT, but it looks like it, okay. <laughs> there is no way you can find a relationship between sinking rate and actually uh, size of particles. That's why I stopped to talk about size. But it seems that there is something about the particle composition in that plot here. Uh, it seems that for some of them, you could see the part of relationship. And, and why do we care about this? It's, uh, so we had Judith talking about, the, the, about this this morning, but. Uh, if uh, this is a plot that is redone from Quan and in 2009, and what you have is uh, here the remineralization depth, 
and the global uh, the change of carbon in the ocean uh, uh, in function of this. So uh, basically, uh, depending on the particle type, their sinking rate, their shape, their size, uh, what it means is that depending on the composition of the system itself, you can slide on this direction, on this direction, and so change dramatically the remineralization depth. And as long as we don't understand how this impacts these depths, we won't be able to estimate uh, the remineralization of anything in the water column. So now we get, I get to the title, finally. <laughs> so why I picked that title, because for the last 20 years, I looked at gray images, and, and that's what particles look like. It's, it's different gray, and, uh, and we can use actually this information, if you think about data science, to try to infer processes from these gray level images. So before to get to uh, shape, I'll get to what they are. So this is something you can do by uh, using machine learning. You look at images, you classify them, and then you have a bunch of images, and you can produce maps of uh, different type of organisms. That's the first bit of information that is useful for models because it constrains a bit the biomass and the biomaps of, uh, let's say, phytoplankton type here. Colodarian, uh, that's the total biomass, and copepods. So we start to get to this using like large amount of imaging data that are coming available quickly. The other thing that you can do is use particle properties. So it's, it's easy to annotate images, kind of, when you have a good training set, but what is even easier is to extract properties of images, like there is size, their shape in general, their gray level, and you can use that to extract traits of the system. So I'll show you an example of what we've been doing on, on plankton, not particles and particles directly, but um, uh, when you do this, uh, you, you get a bunch of particle properties, and you can use this property to define their morphological space, we call. Uh, so this is the space of the morphology of all the objects that you can find when you do a cruise, for example. And, and then you can use that space to try to infer functions or stuff like this. So that was a work done by uh, Laure. Um, the, she, she was working on a data set of Green Age, the Green Age cruise. And um, so when you look at the bunch of images from that cruise, what you could see clearly is that when you look at the two main or three main components that explain the variability of the data set itself. The first thing is size, the second is opacity, and then the elongation, which also get back to size, but the more specific aspect of their size, and the complexity of their shape for the fourth axis. So then you can do that information to try to look at all the images at once and, and see patterns. Uh, so that's the pattern of the, the, the size of the object. So what you could see is that you have a frontier that define two different systems, and on one side you have only large copepods. On the other side you have small copepods. Then you get into the second axis of the variability, and what you had is transparency. So on one hand you had like opaque copepods, and the other one you had transparent copepods. And so it looks like not a lot of information, but actually it tells you things about the behavior of the system. And so what was hypothesized is that uh, the system was completely different here than there. And on that side, you had like wealthy copy that that uh, fed a lot. And so what you could see from this image is their get content or the, the, the red pigment of this, uh, of this copy pod that were present here. So uh, using the, the same philosophy that is used to extract traits of plankton, we can try to work on aggregates and see what we can do with it. Why? It's because you've seen that paper, uh, that slide before from uh, Durkin and uh, and and what people that have been working on fluxes in sediment trap have been doing for the last 40 years, like Debbie, it's like putting poop in boxes, which sounds not as interesting as it is, 
But when you do that, you can refine a bit uh, information of the content and so get to a better estimate of fluxes. This is super fun and super cool exercise, except that it's extremely time consuming and, and you cannot have an army of master and PhD students putting poop in boxes for years. So uh, what we're gonna try to do is to use the same philosophy that we did on the plankton to try to work on the particles themselves to try to do that in a very automatic way. Because what we want is also the process to be sufficiently automatic to be uh, reproduced by anyone using the same instrument, for example. So that's the, the first thing that uh, uh, a postdoc in our lab did uh, uh, a while back. She, she took a bunch of data from uh, the same Green Age crews that uh, I described for the plankton, and, and she did that morphospace for the particle and split that in, in different boxes. And she managed to extract five different types of aggregate, the dark one, elongated one, flakes, fluffy, agglomerated. And what she could do, do then is to put this type of aggregates on, on the system behavior. And what you could see is that, uh, the, the, uh, for example, here on the ice, uh, under the ice uh, edge here, you had uh, uh, mainly diatom at the surface that lead to a specific type of aggregate that were sinking pretty fast. And on the other side, you had like fluffy things that were not sinking that fast, but they were big. And so you have a direct link between the community composition at surface and the type of aggregate that you find at depth. And that starts to be information that you can use also to uh, better model the system. But that was one cruise. And if you look at the amount of images data that we get now on a regular basis, so you, we went back to the 2008 when the imaging system that we developed started to be available to now. It's like we, it's an exponential increase because it's cheaper and a lot of people are using it. You've been, I mean, hearing about the UVP all over the place in that niche. And, and all these data are becoming available. So now it's just the imaging data that we have in the lab. It's like 200 million images. So it's not something that you can handle easily. But if you use an appropriate pipeline, then you can normalize the way you treat the data. And so this is what we try to do. Uh, Miriam in our lab is, uh, is working on this. So same thing, morphospace or morphological space. Then you split the thing in different boxes. You have the large one, the small one, et cetera. And, and what you have, it's a complex space of morphology that you can split in different bits. And, and the next level of this is to try to find the, the, the part of that space that are useful to better estimate, for example, the sinking rate based on their shape. So just an example, if you take the full morphospace of the aggregate that we have in the database, uh, you just look at one aspect, the, the small and dark particles that look like this, you can clearly start to see that there are patterns. Uh, some, um, some location and time, you had clearly more uh, or low, a low concentration of these particles compared to the other one. So it clearly tells you that the system is behaving differently and, there is a, and, and now the, the the next step is to link that to plankton community composition and, and to fluxes. Because what we want is to make that automatic. Once you go at sea, you have an imaging instrument, you plug your data into the system and they give you particle types, which is something that could be done manually, but if you can do that on an automatic way and tease apart the different part of particles that are driving the fluxes, then you can play with it a little bit uh, faster and easier. Another thing that we can do is uh, to, so that was the shape of the particles, but there's a lot more information uh, in these data sets. And, and uh, the idea is to, so that's just a few points, but as, like you've seen on the plot before, you have, we have a lot of profiles now. And the idea is to be able to get global products of particle shape or particle size or whatever. So the idea is to how to upscale this. And we want to have this type of information, not at the surface only, but through the water column because profiles are available up to 6,000 meters. So the idea here is, uh, so we, we working, uh, I'm working with a student, uh, Roman that is from computer science, actually not oceanography, but it's, it's a complex system, a data science problem. So uh, 
it's, it's clearly we need to have a data science approach. And so uh, upscaling these, I mean, machine learning is everywhere. It's a buzzword, but actually it's a useful tool. So what we could do, it's, uh, so we have a lot of particle size spectrum. Uh, Daniel has been doing it a bit here, but I mean, a lot of people are working on this. The idea here is instead of predicting the size distribution of the aggregates, what we want to do is to predict the individual abundance of all the different aggregates in their size classes. Once you do that, you can, uh, with like if you if you use an intelligent uh, CNN, for example, um, you can you can rebuild the global distribution of the particle at surface. And what we want to do, so that's a classical CNN, it's to expand that knowledge to depth. And so for that, there are other specific neural networks that you can use that take into account, for example, time series. Uh, the point meaning that points are dependent from the others. Uh, the the n plus one depend on n. So if you do that, then you can rebuild the shape of the profile based on the model that you build at surface. So that's one of the step forward that we will have. And, and to do that, what we want to do is to have enough context at surface. So having a semi-Lagrangian approach, meaning that you want to have space and time of different type of information at surface, different satellite products, uh, and, and, uh, and then integrate that knowledge into the model that you will be with the CNN to be able to predict the, 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 the size distribution of your aggregates uh, at large. So we've been working on this a bit. That's one of the first results. So when you do the model and just look at one size class, actually the model is not too bad. So it's just a test set here, but we need to improve that and do it. Uh, I mean, the UVP 7 to 27 classes, we won't do that on the 27, but uh, if you do it on, let's say, 5 to 10 classes, then you can rebuild particle concentration independently from one class to the other and see maybe if the spectrum at the end is something that you would predict if you use the size distribution knowledge at first. So uh, I told you that thinking speed is a nightmare to, to, to measure. So this is something that we try to do as well because uh, it's, it's, if you want to have a model to predict thinking rate, you need to measure thinking rate. And, and um, it might not, I mean, it's a complex cloud of data that we've seen before, but maybe there is something to understand from it. So uh, we've been working, for example, with Ken, with the TZX, to, uh, to put a UVP on it and get direct measurement of thinking rates, uh, tracking particles in the imaging system. Uh, Tristan and Manon has been working on this also uh, with a, what they call a Visutrap, which has a UVP in it also to track particle thinking in it. And so all these type of uh, test instruments have been deployed during Apero. If you want to know more about Apero, you can see Laurent. And so that's just an example of the thing that we can get if you take the part of the, the, so that's the frame of the UVP. And here is one of the particles that you have. Manon will uh, have a poster on this, I think. Uh, you can track the particles sinking in the, in the field of view of the instruments. And so because you can do that, then you can infer the, directly the sinking rate from like time and space. And, and what is cool here is that you can link that to an image. And then if you think back to what I said, if you have this global map of image and you can characterize this image and you can find a way to link image type to thinking rates, then we get to something that starts to be useful for modelers. The thing is when you do this, you have still to do a lot of manual verification because you, you get tracks, but sometimes it's not the thing you think they are in the images, so you split them. Finally, you get to a validated number of tracks, and you try to explain what is actually driving the, the different pattern of the speed that you see, uh, going back to this morpho space. And, and finally, I'll talk to you about omics and images because these, to me, are at the two end well, two end members of the modeling world. If you take the genomic aspect, what is cool is that you can get into metabolic modeling and really understand what's happening on the particle directly. When you look at particle size distribution and particle shape, what you can actually get is maybe global estimate of fluxes. And so what we want to do is to find a way to link these two types of models that are very different. I mean, uh, looking at an Earth system model or looking at a metabolic model, it's two completely different abstractions of the system but maybe there's a way we can link it. And so that's 
more for the discussion, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi, Lino. Great talk. Um, I was wondering what the possibilities of expanding this to UVP6 would be, since you're, uh, for UVP6 you're just getting particle size distributions and some classifications, but not the features. So you, because this is done on UVP5, you mean? Yes. Yeah, but the, the principle is the same, except that the training set has to be different because there are slow, small differences between the instruments. But, but without the features, you're able... Well, you, you have the features in UVP6. Oh, okay. It's just okay. that the one on Argo, you don't recover it. When you don't recover it, you don't have them because it's just direct prediction inside the instrument. It's embedded classification. But uh, with the UVP6, if you, rec if you recover the instrument on the Argo, you can do it. And you have a UVP6 HF that is a standard UVP5, and you have the same thing that comes out of it. Thanks, Lionel. That was wonderful. Um, just to follow up on the previous question, um, so you can do the same analyses with UV6, UVP6 data and presumably with other kinds of imaging data. Yep. Can you integrate them all into one co in consistent set? So uh, if you have UVP6 data, is the morpho cluster, cluster is going to be not co comparable so, to other data types? Yeah, that's a good question. This is something we, we are trying to assess. Um, it depends on the model that you use. Uh, building a training set on all of them seems to have biases. Uh, so there are ways maybe we can normalize a bit this uh, across instruments that have similar characteristics, but taking, for example, IFCB and UVP data won't work. Uh, taking two different generations of UVP, maybe there's something that we can do in that morpho space. Because it seems that for, for at least for aggregates, when you overplot the morpho space of one or the other, you have a lot of overlap. Uh, whether in some, as, some bit of that space, you don't see different, you see different things because it's different in generation version, we don't know yet. Yeah, so maybe we can come up with, we community-wise can come up with features that aren't yeah. specific. So if the grayscale is somehow yeah. normalized or maybe not used because the so, shape details maybe could be transferable in a consistent So the thing we do is we, we are trying different pipeline right now. So you use, we use uh, features, which are the principal, the, the main thing that we do at first. But you can also use, for example, CNN to extract features, which are nonsense. You take like, a, you know, you take thousands of features, and then you use another approach to classify them. So that bit, maybe that's where we can actually get to features in that extraction of features from the CNN that are similar of the different instruments, but we don't know yet. If you merged to yeah. the training data, included examples yeah. from different. Yeah, got it. Okay, thanks. Very cool. Uh, I was wondering, you know, because people worry about, uh, you know, climate change, you know, how that might affect the uh, the state of the sea, whether it's being weakened or not. You know, in your title, you have the biodiversity in there. So can is it possible, you know, like by monitoring the some kind of a biodiversity indice using your data for us to judging whether the you know state of the BCT is uh, maintained or is changing? So just curious. Thank you. Well, with the instrument imaging instrument, the UVP clearly I doubt you're going to be able to do that because the way you cluster things in uh, species is at a very high level. Uh, you have 100 different classes, which I guess will be complex to use to assess change over time. But if you use metagenomic data, for example, that's con completely doable, except that you need time series, and metagenomic data are pretty young. So I think you need to have both approaches together to be able to uh, look at changes over time which is not just only related to season, but to actually climate change and see how that impacts 
the difference, like the variability of the fluxes at the end, because you can have change in community that will not change the fluxes because of the function, the function I maintain, for example, and that we don't know yet. Um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. If you had to design a UVP7, what, what, what would you want in the imaging device itself that would make and make an improvement? Make improvements. I'm not going to do one. <laughs> no, but we, what, so one big limitation always is, uh, I mean, few, it's limited to the volume of uh, the, the given image and the resolution of the sensor, which are actually linked. Um, so what I'm thinking about is actually, we need to have a better resolution of the spectrum itself for particles, but also for plankton, because a lot of things we assign to particles in the small size range of the spectrum might be living things, but we don't know. And so the thing that I'm heading for, it's like to have two types, one that look at the small hand of the spectrum, one that looking at the high hand of the spectrum with the same technology, the same pipeline for the analysis, but that we can merge. So at the end, you'll be able to get like plankton, phytoplankton and, and zooplankton uh, with the same type of imaging products and pipeline to analyze them. So that would be the development. And you wouldn't piss Mark off. So, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question in terms of the, the p images that you can take about zooplankton. I was wondering if you're thinking about intercalibrating or collaborating with the zooplankton community just because now there's a lot of interest about traits, mm -hmm. and it seems like you can measure with all your uh, computation analysis, you can measure size. But since you have a, such a nice global coverage, you can actually relate these differences in yeah. sizes of certain species to... Yeah. climate change and stuff like that. So I was wondering if you... Yeah, this is current work that we do in the lab. I mean, we, we, the, the lab in Villefranche has a long-standing history of working on zooplankton. And, uh, and so imaging came late into the development because it was uh, by just looking at something that was scalable to get to global scale. But uh, we use nets a lot and we have plankton collection. And Fabien, for example, that is here, is working with someone I don't remember, but to look at the evolution of uh, uh, copepod size in functional space and time uh, to see there is any link with climate change. So, and this is based on the images that we collect and then we go back into collection, look at the samples and sam bring them to the back, take to the microscope and verify everything. So yeah. Um, I was wondering if you tried to kind of reverse the order of things and from the particle features, can you predict the microbial community composition even in, if it is like in very broad strokes? Um, sorry? I'm trying... I'm try, <laughs> trying to think if we've done it, because we're trying a lot of stuff. That's one I'm not sure. Not, not the com we've been trying to do the diversity itself, um, but the community composition per se, no. But there is an issue there is that you try to predict something that has a lot of classes with something that has few features. So there will be a statistical issue, which is not simple to resolve. But uh, anyway, no, we haven't done it yet. Further questions? So we done. I'd like to thank Leno for a for a for a great talk and